Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ask the S Experts on Afghanistan, hosted by the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. My name is Sara Moeller and I'm an assistant professor here in the school where I teach and research on international security topics. Before we begin today's event in a moment, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So I'd like to ask everyone to please pause for a moment of silence to remember the victims of that day, as well as the US and allied servicemen and women and Afghan civilians who have lost their lives in the intervening two decades. Thank you. And for those of you joining us from McQuaid Hall or another classroom on campus, please remember to social distance and keep your masks on indoors. Thank you. I also want to begin by thanking a uh, professor of practice, David Wood of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies here at the School of Diplomacy, who was instrumental in making today possible. And uh, we're lucky to also have him available to field Q&A later on. I'm delighted to introduce our panel of experts who are joining us today to discuss the momentous events that have occurred in Afghanistan over the summer. And in a moment, I'll introduce each of them and their backgrounds separately. Uh, but uh, you should know that I've asked each of them to speak for five or so minutes on their assigned topics before we'll open it up to a general question and answer session from the audience, followed by closing remarks. Uh, when we get to the question and answer session, please use the chat function or the raise your hand feature if you wish to ask a question. Our first panelist today is Ambassador Saeed Jalal Karim. He has had a distinguished career in the Afghan diplomatic service and most recently served as ambassador and special envoy for the president of Afghanistan to Saudi Arabia from 2016 to 2020. He was a candidate for president in the Afghan 2009 presidential elections and has been a longtime advocate of opening talks with the Taliban. The ambassador will briefly cover how we got here, as well as his assessment of the new Taliban government, and finally, what we can expect in the coming months. Our second panelist of the day is Andrew Watkins of the U.S. Institute of Peace in more than 10 provinces in Afghanistan in a variety of roles, including as a political affairs officer with the United Nations, as an independent researcher, sir, researcher, researcher excuse me, a conflict analyst, and as an advisor to the humanitarian community. And I've asked him to discuss the international community's reaction to the Doha agreement and U.S. Taliban negotiations in general, as well as his thoughts about what role, if any, the, U, the international community can play in Afghanistan going forward. Our third panelist will be moving up. Sarah, you appear to have gone mute. Still mute. Unfortunately, still mute. Andrew, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, David. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it might. So um, suddenly the. The, vo the volume is very, very low from your end, Sarah, so it could be an internet connection issue or it could be an IT issue. Yeah, I'm trying my best to. Now you're back. You can hear me? OK, apologies Wonderful. for that. Um, uh, I was, uh, why don't I hold off introducing uh, the remainder of the panelists and we'll get straight to Saeed. My apologies for the technical dif uh, difficulties. Ambassador, please take it away. Uh, Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much uh, 
for uh, our university to arrange such a, a panel and uh, thank you for our distinguished guests all of us i uh, hope that we will be able to provide some thoughtful information regarding this issue uh, i will start uh, how we got here and um, uh, when president trump decided to end the longest u.s war zalmay khalilzad decided that the best way would be to negotiate with taliban get them politically accepted by the world remove them from the blacklist and make an interim government in which they will have a majority and have them fight ISIS and terrorism. And that agreement was reached with them on that basis. If the agreement implemented by the Afghan government and the US and Taliban properly, it would have given Afghanistan an interim government with inclusive of Taliban, the Afghan government, Afghanistan politicians, and all ethnic groups. However, the biggest obstacle to the, to the agreement and the proposal by the United States government was President Ashraf Ghani, who refused the interim government, refused the peace proposal, and, uh, and re refused to release most of the Taliban prisoners, and also refused to resign, which made the Taliban to start a very, very big war. The Taliban started attacking three major uh, provinces of Afghanistan, but after that, the Taliban, with the mediation of the tribal leaders in ulama, convinced the governors of the 28 provinces and with the help of the, the army chiefs, the police chiefs, the army decided not to fight and more than 28 provinces just surrendered to the Taliban, with, including Kabul, without any fight. The main reason for reaching to this status was the unacceptable financial corruption, political corruption and lack of security and justice that the government of Afghanistan could not provide for its people, uh, which is uh, unfortunately that this was all happening under the, the, the eyes of the international community and the presence of the United States and other governments. Now, Taliban and uh, President Ghani escaped from Afghanistan. The Taliban entered Kabul without a fight. The, arm, the whole army did not fight. and. Currently, we have a Taliban status quo government. Now, the status quo government uh, is a completely 100% Victorian side government with its members from the rank of Taliban, according to seniority and loyalty and involvement in the, in the, in the war. So it is not, uh, many people say that the Taliban have among themselves problems, uh, differences. I do not believe in that. The same, the same uh, the deputy prime minister who was in that last government is currently the prime minister. So the, the ranks are very, very acceptable according to their involvement and loyalty. The government does not have in its rank of ministers, women, or any other political parties. The government the Taliban has named is called an interim government, and they have promised that it will have uh, more inclusivity. The new government will be in the form of an emirate with a prime minister, and two deputy prime ministers, and later on, the chief of councils and shuras later on to be introduced. It is believing that the second rank of the minister, the deputy ministers, will include bureaucrats and experts who will be able to run the ministries accordingly. It's also believing that women would be allowed in the third rank. Uh, women are not currently at the ministry level or the deputy minister level, but the Taliban has promised that they will be involved and other ranks. Now, where are where are we going? What is exactly happening right now? Okay, politically, politically, I think that uh, doc, Dr. Khalil Zad uh, uh, and the United States government uh, lobbying for this uh, proposal of peace have managed to convince China, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Qatar, Indonesia, and Pakistan, who would most probably be one of the first countries who will deal with Taliban politically and economically. Their embassies will be in Afghanistan, whether they recognize the government of Afghanistan or doesn't recognize, but there will be a form of government. Now, United States and also uh, European Union, the British uh, and many other countries have also accepted to deal with the Taliban, uh, work with them, whether it's acceptable, it's another format, it is dealing with the government of the, the Taliban, whether you recognize them or not recognize them. 
the Saudi Arabia and many other countries, uh, Arab countries, uh, other than Qatar, I think they're going to wait to see the United Nations and United States and European uh, efforts more, and then they will take a decision because of their past experience for uh, of recognition of the Taliban government at the beginning, and they were criticized for that. So I think that that will be on, on hold a little bit. Now, they have also, uh, the, the, the Taliban have in the past couple of, uh, couple of days, what they have done, they have removed the militias, they have gathered uh, 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 illegal, uh, illegal weapons mostly. So from my contacts in Kabul and all over this, the most of the cities of Afghanistan, I'm hearing that security is very, very well off in most of the places, uh, very few places where there are a little bit of, of uh, uh, fighting, but very little, maybe 1%, maximum 1%. Now, I do not believe that at this stage they will allow political parties to have participation as parties. They might involve independent political people or politicians, but outside their party as bureaucrats and as people who will work in the, in the government. Also, the education for women at primary university has been accepted with certain restrictions. Media, private media has been allowed with restrictions. It is anticipated that they will support business community and allow free trade. They have said that it is, it is their government uh, agreement with the US that they will fight terrorism and not allow Afghanistan to be, to be used as a base for terrorism. So that is exactly where we are currently. And I think that uh, we, need, we will talk about it further later on in the questions and answers of the international community and other things. So I don't want to take more of the time of the, our panelists. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I just want to check, can everyone hear me right now? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that very crisp synopsis, Ambassador. I have already got lots of questions, follow-up questions for you myself, but I will hold off on those right now because I'd like to turn to our next panelist, Andrew Watkins of the U.S. Institute of Peace, for his take on the role of the international community, both that they played in recent months, uh, going back to the Doha Agreement, and uh, today and looking forward. Andrew, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Professor, and, and thanks to everyone for having me. Um, the international community over the past two years has undertaken an unprecedented level of engagement with the Taliban. Uh, it's easy to think of that as obvious and necessary today, given what we've seen unfold across Afghanistan in the recent months, uh, as the ambassador has outlined for us. But two years ago, this was an incredibly controversial position for the United States to take. And this was born out of a realization in the United States, primarily due to domestic considerations, uh, political considerations, that the United States would at some point uh, want to withdraw from Afghanistan, its military presence and a good deal of the rest of its engagement. Therefore, withdrawing with some sort of political settlement was seen as the most stable way to exit the country. The only issue was the United States had engaged in a very quiet, low level degree of dialogue with the Taliban insurgency to varying degrees for much of the last decade. And the Taliban had always been consistent on a single point it would not engage in dialogue with the United States if the Afghan government was also at the table. And so what changed in early 2019 is the United States actually caved and made a huge concession to the Taliban in order to get a peace process started and what it hoped would turn into peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban. The United States sat down with the Taliban alone. This started a trajectory that many critics of the process have later suggested uh, led to a path dependence that created an almost inevitable outcome that legitimized and strengthened the Taliban, weakening the Afghan government by delegitimizing it and, and uh, leading to the events that we've seen uh, unfold in the last weeks and months. The argument from the United States was that it was simply acknowledging something that had become more and more true over much of the last decade, which is the Taliban had been gaining momentum across the country 
and the Afghan government's position was growing increasingly fraught, not just in terms of governance across Afghanistan, but also in its increased dependence on Western and external aid, uh, which was eventually likely to decrease. The rest of the international community had a variety of responses to this US approach, but in some, everyone shared a same basic reaction, which was to wait and see. Whether it was NATO partners that had been engaged with the United States for much of the last 20 years, or whether it was regional players, neighbors of Afghanistan, or other uh, somewhat adversarial regional powers such as Russia and China, all states interested and engaged with Afghan affairs essentially decided to wait and see what the outcome of this US driven attempt to create a peace process would be. Um, European nations, contributors to the NATO mission or simply large donors to Afghan development and the Afghan government uh, were highly critical of the US approach. There was even a degree of public and open debate among different NATO partners, but in essence, all other European, NATO, and Western countries that were partnered up with the United States were dependent on the security umbrella that the US military force there provided. In essence, other Western nations had little choice but to follow NATO's mantra of in together, out together. If the United States was out, so was everyone else. Regional countries began to more openly embrace an approach that they had taken starting all the way back in 2014, when at the end of the Obama administration, US and NATO military presence really drew down to a small fraction of what it had been a decade ago. When this started to happen and the world started to see the weaknesses of the Afghan government, military, political, and otherwise, Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, and other neighboring and regional states began to very quietly, but, but very pragmatically reposition themselves and their relationship with the Taliban. In essence, long before the United States came to the realization that it would need to acknowledge the Taliban's strength across the country, many regional states had been doing this for years. And we already see themselves positioning uh, in the months to come to be able to accept the Taliban as the sole authority across the country. I've gone a bit too long with my summary. I know there's much more to talk about how the international community postures itself towards a future Afghan government, but I want to hand it back to other panelists and I know there will be plenty in the Q&A. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, and now, uh, next on the agenda is myself. And uh, I am, as I mentioned, an assistant professor here in the School of Diplomacy. I work on alliance politics. And uh, I thought what I would do today is just briefly talk about some of the very public criticisms we've seen, uh, both by members of the media and in particular European officials in recent weeks concerning the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. There have been a lot of charges that uh, both the decision to withdraw, the timeline, and the manner in which the U.S. withdrew has um, weakened U.S. credibility or reputation or resolve. These terms all mean different things in international relations. But the general thrust of the critique is that the U.S. has been weakened in the eyes of external actors, both our adversaries as well as our allies because of the withdrawal. And the most extreme version of this argument that I've seen um, charges that China will infer certain lessons about U.S credibility and staying power or resolve with respect to U.S. commitments to the security of Taiwan. In other words, that China would be emboldened now to try something uh, in Taiwan. Um, personally, I find this ludicrous. Um, and one of the reasons why I do so is because I'm of the belief in school of thought that says that national interests 
a country's national interests change over time and vary by issue area, uh, by location, by strategic interest. And so we also know that studies have shown that in addition to this situational context, leader psychology attributes or variables like leader psychology and organizational biases also matter in how other actors and states perceive credibility and reputation. Um, so my own view is that just because we finally uh, had a U.S. administration that was prepared to acknowledge that the war in Afghanistan was a military misadventure that was lost in my opinion, again, many years ago, and decided to withdraw our remaining troops there, doesn't mean that this decision to withdraw from Afghanistan signals a larger shift in US foreign policy or withdrawal from external commitments. Um, leaders assess the risks and benefits from the operations they commit national resources to on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and so there's been a lot of criticism, Andrew mentioned some of it, from our NATO allies. Uh, and I've written and spoken on this topic. Um, some of the criticism is valid, other aspects are not. I'm happy to go into that in the Q&A. But my own view here is that we should not, or we should be careful about inferring any bigger shifts in U.S. foreign policy with respect to weakened U.S. credibility or reputation in the eyes of both our adversaries and allies because of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, I'll leave it there and turn it over to our last panelist, who is my colleague in the department, uh, Professor Huddleston, who will be speaking on the issue of diplomatic uh, recognition of the Taliban. Professor Huddleston? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm also an assistant professor here in the School of Diplomacy. Um, I, I, my research is on rec, uh, is on diplo, uh, diplomacy by separatist and self-determination groups, and as well on recognition of those groups. So I may accidentally slip into some terminology that applies to separatists and doesn't quite fit with what we're dealing with in Afghanistan. And I hope uh, you'll forgive me if I if I go that direction. So yeah, I want to talk about recognition, and I plan to talk about it from a sort of much more bird's eye view, sort of how traditionally have we thought about recognition. So very often we think of diplomatic recognition as kind of a final step towards uh, sovereignty of a state. So really quickly, I just want to break down how we think about sovereignty, right? We generally think about there being four types, um, domestic sovereignty, meaning having control over security and legal institutions in a territory, sovereignty over borders um, with neighboring countries, uh, what we call Westphalian sovereignty, which is that you know, the rest of the world agrees that within these boundaries, there is a state and that state has um, certain rights in, in international affairs, like the right of non-interference. And finally, international legal sovereignty, which is recognition of the government who controls the territory, right? So that's where we are right now, looking at international legal sovereignty of the Taliban. They're the effective controller of most of the territory. They've taken control of most of the cities. Um, not, to every, not everyone's happy about this, but they do have a lot of domestic support, right? And, you know, these two levels of sovereignty, domestic and international, they operate separately, right? So in a, in a state like Somalia, we all, the, the world recognizes a single state of Somalia, even though the domestic government uh, is not in full control, does not have good domestic, so domestic sovereignty there, right? There's, there's other groups within, there's a, there's a whole uh, de facto state in the North in Somaliland that claims to be its own country. Right? And then you'll have countries uh, or, or de facto states like Northern Cyprus, which has strong domestic sovereignty, but is only recognized by one country, right? So it has weak international legal sovereignty, right? So when we think about international sovereignty, right, we basically see two kind of competing ideas or competing logics on how it should work, right? So the first is sort of this idea of declaratory sovereignty, right? Which can simply be broken down as follows. Uh, 
we look at, at the situation, it's evident that a group has strong domestic sovereignty and we should acknowledge it and live with it and work with this new government, right? Um, we could th be thinking about the Taliban right now uh, and it applies to, to other situations as well. This kind of idea has less focus on normative elements, you know, questions about, is this a good government? Is this a government we like? Does it have, does it respect human rights? Does it respect women's rights, right? Those issues for a declaratory model, they don't play, they don't play as strong a role because the real question is just, is this group in control like they say they are? And is this the only group we can work with if we want any dealings in this country? Right, so this is often called the effective control doctrine. And it's been the dominant one for most of history from World War II, except with separatist conflicts. The other idea is something called the constitu constitutive recognition, right? Where we see recognition as a way of legitimizing or endorsing a government, right? Re recognition is a political tool used to express preference about how domestic politics work, right? So underneath that is a recognition that international recognition and diplomacy, this is where international sovereignty lives. This is where um, political power on the international stage is seated, right? So we can, so, so countries sometimes think, well, is it politically expedient to allow this government to be a member of the system with the rest of us, right? So in general, um, the effective control element has sort of started to give way more and more to a more political kind of recognition, right? Historically, for example, historically, the con if a, a, a rebel group or a insurgent group took control of the capital of a country, usually that would result in a cascade of recognition, right? For, through much of, through much of um, history since World War II. But we look, if we look at situations like that in Libya or Yemen, we now see that the governments preferred by Western countries and other countries might just move the capital and have recognition of international sovereignty move along with it. This is kind of a new phenomenon, right? And it's worth sort of thinking about when that transition was made, right? For a, for a few weeks there, some wanted this kind of model in Afghanistan with the sort of national resistance front holdouts in the Panjshir Valley, right, which, which um, fell just to, to the Taliban just a few days ago. So let's, let's come back and look at the Taliban like this, right? So long, the longstanding tradition would say, look, they have effective control of Kabul and of many major cities and of most of the country. We should treat this as the, as the Afghan government, right, because it is the Afghan government, right? More recent ideas would say, well, we can still use this as a political tool. Right. So this is really the debate here about diplomatic recognition. Um, many observers right now are very quick to point out what we don't like about um, Taliban control of the Afghan government. For one is evidence of poor legitimacy, protests, images of people trying to flee, images of women picking up weapons and shooting at, at Taliban fighters as they come in. Right. We look at these images and we say, oh, surely they don't have good legitimacy. But it's also worth saying, wait a minute. How did the Taliban get into this position in the first place? Was, was it not the case, as the ambassador said, that in a sense we were supporting and propping up a government that actually had very, very deep legitimacy problems to begin with, right? So we look at these things we don't like and we say, maybe we should use this as a political tool. But it's worth thinking about the cost of non-recognition or sticking with this unofficial engagement, right? Humanitarian programs can be hurt by a policy of non-recognition. If we look at what has happened in Yemen, you see parts of the government controlled by the Houthis. The international aid programs are, are really hampered by the fact that very few governments are wanting to work with the de facto authorities in that region, right? Some have brought up Russia and China. Well, we can think about a, a sort of contest over having influence in this place and the effects of non-recognition on that, right? And then finally, questions about credibility, right? Clearly, the Chinese and Russian governments are already heavily involved. What will it mean if we're just a holdout, if Western countries are just a holdout on saying we don't want to recognize this government? At the same time, it's clear that the Taliban 
recognizes the weight that a lot of countries are putting in this decision and recognize that, that uh, and see that if they make the right adjustments in domestic structures, um, that maybe it will be easier, right? And maybe we, maybe we think that's a good source of pressure, right? Pressure, uh, pressure to have better human rights protections, not to harbor terrorist organizations, to include other political parties, right? Um, they see, they clearly are seeing this pressure. The Taliban clearly has a strong, uh, perceives a strong incentive to sort of line up with the way other countries um, behave in the international system. And part of that is because they want recognition, right? So I really haven't answered the question of what the United States should do, right? And, um, but I do get the sense that what we have is this is not really a question of if, but when, right? So the really, we have two sort of competing wishes here. Should we go ahead and accept this new reality that all of us are sensible enough to look at and see that they have effective control, right? And realize this diplomatically in, in Western countries? Or should we continue to dangle international sovereignty to extract concessions? Things like um, encouraging more competition in the system, right? And then the follow-up question with that is, how long would that work? And do we risk creating another pariah state like North Korea if we continue on that kind of policy? So that's the question I'm going to leave leave you with, and I'll I'll end there. Excellent, for excellent set of remarks. Thank you very much, Professor Huddleston. And while we wait for the meeting chat to be opened uh, so that we can accumulate some questions, I'm going to take advantage of the uh, moderator's prerogative. Uh, and ask uh, the first set of questions before calling on uh, Professor Wood. So I want to go back to something that you said, um, uh, Ambassador, at the outset of your comments, and I want to push you a little bit about your claim that the Taliban is a unified or consolidated movement. Um, because uh, from what I've seen, um, there are different factions. Uh, we've heard a lot from the Haqqani faction, uh, and of course Haqqani is the new uh, named interior minister. Um, we know his network has connections with Al-Qaeda. Um, so it seems like there may be more factional differences uh, of opinion uh, within the Taliban, um, and at least from the Western media coverage that I've seen. So I'd like you to respond to that. And then my second question will be for Andrew, and I wonder since um, uh, you were kind enough uh, to, 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 to uh, leave us hanging and wanting more, I wonder if you could actually address and speak to those sort of future prospects for, um, uh, for the international community's role in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, a lot of it will hinge on uh, some of the remarks that Professor Professor Huddleston made as well, um, but I will um, leave it there if, uh, and give the ambassador a, uh, a chance to respond first before turning it over to you. Thank you. Ambassador, you're muted, sorry. I've had personal uh, experience with the negotiation and peace deal with the Taliban. I was one of the first people to arrange uh, discussion between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban prior to Dr. Khalilzad being involved. But unfortunately, as I said, President Ghani was not ready. Now, uh, during this, the Taliban has uh, what you call as Amir, the Amir of the, uh, of the, and everybody under that Emirate, it has 100% allegiance to that number one under, under oath of Quran. Okay. Now, Haqqani uh, the group and also Yaqub and uh, also Brother and all of these people, they have given a, a oath of allegiance. So no matter what happens, the number one person decides, everybody will listen. It's as simple as that. Now, if we come back and look at, at the appointments which has happened, there's no difference in the appointments. Haqqani is the Minister of Interior, Yaqub is the Minister of, um, of Defense, the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister, what used to be the Deputy Prime Minister at their past government, and all the rank people, if you see, they're actual uh, very, very loyal people to the Taliban from day one. So uh, this issue of, of, uh, of having relationship with Al-Qaeda, not having relationship with Al-Qaeda, I think that the U.S. negotiation with, uh, with Taliban has solved that issue, knowing that, knowing that the 
Haqqani is a deputy of uh, uh, number two in the, uh, uh, in the organization. Okay, they knew that. And the American government, while negotiating, they knew that if a government would come, Haqqani and Yaqub will be on the topest position of military positions. So we do know that, we know those, those facts. That's not going to change anything within the international community. Putting them on the blacklist is not going to change anything. They've been on the blacklist for the past 20 years. So has nothing changed? The only way that we can change them is engaging with them and trying to uh, uh, giving them leverages on things that we would like from them against the, the political recognition, economical development help, other technical help that we can do. But uh, putting them on the short list, putting their people in prisons, they were in Guantanamo, they were in Kabul, 40,000 people were in prison, nothing happened. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew, would you like to speak to uh, the future prospects of the international community's involvement, please? I would, I'm happy to, Professor, but I, I have to jump in with a two finger on, on the previous question, just because this was a topic of some extended research that I conducted in, in 2018 and 2019. This idea that the Taliban might be a, a factionalized or fragmented uh, insurgency. You, you mentioned that it's not something that many uh, casual observers or an American audience might be familiar with, but actually for those who have been working in US policy, uh, looking at Afghanistan, I found that there is an overemphasis on Taliban factions and on different competing interests or stakeholders within the Taliban. In fact, it is a picture of the Taliban that is so misleading that for years, both US and Afghan government policymakers looked at different figures and stakeholders and camps within the Taliban and believed and assessed all of those different interests to indicate weakness, when in fact, no one is more concerned with the Taliban's different factions and competing interests than the Taliban's leadership themselves. And maintaining their sense of unity and cohesion has been a number one priority of their movement uh, since they were founded, much less, uh, you know, as, as an insurgency, you know, struggling to survive. Um, it is what many scholars call a polycentric organization. It's just a fancy way of saying that they have many different centers of power and many different powerful figures. But as the ambassador said, they're bound together by a couple different things. One of the most important of which is a sense of loyalty and obedience to a, a single figure, but also to an idea, to a very, very simple idea which is all of us are brothers in a struggle to eject the foreign influences from our country. And there's such a unity in that idea that no other Afghan political faction or party has had, not in recent history. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so I think, um, I think that's an excellent point, particularly that what they have in common, right, is the uh, aversion uh, to foreign forces. And it's also your comments and the ambassador suggests something that I've long suspected as well, which is that, you know, and what we've seen witnessed in, in, in the rapid collapse of the uh, Asaf Ghani um, uh, government last month is uh, that the Western intelligence services after 20 years still did not understand the enemy well. Just briefly on on the, I think there's a way to transition from this point to the question about the international community because there are some, as to your point of not understanding the enemy well, we have to ask how well we understand the Taliban today. And there are many people who are trying to begin to understand how to deal with a future Taliban government by examining the named appointed cabinet members. Um, but I think the ambassador alluded to this, it's not even clear if the people who have been named to cabinet positions if those cabinet roles are going to be the most important thing about the Taliban as an organization. There's still so much uh, that many in the international community don't understand about how to engage with this movement. Uh, Professor Hiddleston, Huddleston uh, alluded to the Taliban's interest in being uh, recognized and legitimized by the international community. 
But then we've also talked about how Russia or China or other non-Western states might give them what they believe is sufficient legitimacy. And so why would they bother meeting Western conditions and standards for how to become a part of the world political and economic system if they can get what they feel they need for their state to survive from non-Western aligned powers, then wouldn't it be great from their perspective to not have to change who they are, what their membership believes in, and, and the way they conduct their internal affairs? And, and so what we've seen in, especially in the last six months or so, as it became clear that the United States intended to withdraw from the country regardless of how peace talks went or, or what position the Afghan government was left in, uh, the flip side of the coin of how the international community might engage with the Taliban is a choice that the Taliban seemed to be starting to make. And that is that it began to harden its positions and to reject a lot of the conditionality that the European Union began laying out as early as early 2020, that some in the United States argue today there should be necessary conditions before the Taliban is engaged, certainly officially and formally as a sovereign government, but maybe even unofficially in providing aid and assistance. Well, the Taliban has been listening and paying attention. And over the last six months, as it's begun to see the writing on the wall, even before its successes in the military campaign of the summer, the Taliban began to realize that it might be better off positioning itself cl much closer to China. And of course, China's interests uh, align with its uh, patron-client relationship that it has with Pakistan. And, and the Taliban already has a, a deep and extensive working relationship with the Pakistani security establishment. And the Taliban seem to be quite bullish on the prospects for foreign investment and infrastructure and at least getting the bare minimum of what they need uh, to prop up a state without having to deal with the international community, in, at least in the Western sense. Thank you, and I agree on that last point that uh, certainly with respect to uh, this Taliban approach to the international community, their recognition, as you said, uh, that they will have to interact and need things from the international community is very different from the Taliban of the 1990s. I have my doubts about other asper aspects of uh, their platform, if you can call it that, whether there has been any reform uh, on those other areas. Um, but I will uh, turn it over to Professor Wood, who's been uh, waiting very patiently. And then I'll just um, uh, remind those of you in the audience to submit your questions in the meeting chat. We already have a couple, but uh, over to you, Professor Wood. Wonderful. And thank you, speakers. That was a quite broad range of topics to cover within eight minute bursts, so thank you for that. Um, I suppose when I look at Afghanistan not being an expert, what I see from the outside is it's almost like an analyst's wardrobe. An analyst can go there, pick out some information, wear a different coat. It's almost like we can come up with many different analytical outcomes from the events. So what I've seen in the last week alone is, for example, CMI released a report saying, we didn't do enough local peace building. We didn't do enough to generate accountability, to generate wealth locally, to build inclusive processes. On the other side, I've seen other analysts say, we did too much. We we're spending so much money on gender programming, on things that made us feel good about Afghanistan, rather than those that helped with the process of state building and peace building. So based on that, I have, I suppose, three, three questions, one for, for three of the panelists. Um, the first one is really, uh, Andrew, for you around what do you think is the big learning for how we promote peace in places where you have limited statehood and you have com competition to be provide the legitimate authority? Then for um, Ambassador Syed, um, my question is, how do Afghanis such as you engage with the new government? What is the role that you can play in the development of the government and the state now? And how would you deal with any engagement where it might, where you might question the morality or the ethics of the actions of the government as well? So that would be uh, a question for you. And then for Professor Huddleston, uh, we've also seen today 
that a range of peace building organizations have released a letter um, calling for a rethink on counterterrorism strategy so that we prioritize engagement and dialogue with prescribed groups. One of the fallouts from 2011 was a range of international armed groups or political groups were prescribed, which meant that development actors such as USAID or non-governmental actors could not engage with these groups. It was impossible, they were prescribed, they're off limits. And now we have a, a letter from um, HD Center, CMI, Conciliation Resources, Berghoff Foundation, Intermediate saying, we need to rethink this. Are they right that we need to engage with prescribed groups? And apologies, uh, Dr. Muller, I didn't ask you a question because you're, you're managing the event so marvelously. Andrew, would you like to go first? Sure, of course. Um, you know, I, I think I'll try. I'll try and keep my answer concrete and specific to Afghanistan, even though it's much broader and could be a discussion unto itself. Um, how to incentivize peace building and peacemaking, which at this point I think is or should be much more focused on localized peace building efforts. The sort of which ha many different organizations have tried to implement and, and to build out programmatically around the country over the last 20 years to varying but usually limited degrees of success. Um, a, a, a reconciliation, not necessarily a disarmament of armed groups, but a bringing together of people who up until recent days, just a few short weeks ago, were actively fighting each other incredibly intensely in some parts of the country. And so I think the question is how to incentivize that kind of local peace building, uh, number one, without it being perceived as a, as a foreign imposed, Western influenced uh, set of programs and ideas, that's going to be incredibly difficult because it's often funded by Western states uh, about which the Taliban have already formed uh, pretty set opinions. Um, and so there's a question about how much can regional states get involved or how much can peace building uh, in this context be retooled to be something that's supported by uh, perhaps parties regarded as neutral, whether that's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, whether that's states that have a different relationship with the Taliban, such as the Gulf state of Qatar, which has hosted its peace office, or even Turkey, which, although it's been a NATO partner in Afghanistan, has also been in conversation with the Taliban about technical assistance to operate Kabul's airport, there are examples, and the Taliban trends towards uh, Muslim majority nations, that where I think there could be key players, regional or international players, that could take the role um, that Western donor states often do when it comes to peace building. But I think it has to be incentivized without commodified. I don't think it can be a transactional relationship I think it's a mistake to approach the Taliban to suggest that a, a bountiful peace dividend awaits if they simply get in line and abide by certain conditions, because I think the Taliban has already shown that they're quite happy to dismiss Western conditions if it crosses their own red lines. And so I think thinking creatively, thinking regionally and, and collectively about how to boost local peace building initiatives in Afghanistan, that's gotta be the way forward. Excellent, thank you very much. And I want to, uh, if I can, uh, just because I'm cognizant of the fact that Professor Huddleston has another commitment, I'll go to him very quickly. And then Ambassador, we also have several questions for you in the chat. So we'll give Professor Huddleston a moment uh, and then we'll return to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this, this question is sort of, do you engage with uh, unsavory characters? Um, it, when and, and, and when should you do that? It's, it is very tricky. Um, I think it depends on policy goals and effects, right? We're already in a condition where the, you, you know, with, with the, the way the scope of the 
U.S. involvement. I'm going to talk about the U.S. Um, just to keep it simple. Um, U.S. involved. The way the scope of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan sort of blew up over the course of the 20 and got much expanded, got much bigger, right? It's pretty clear we lost track of those goals. That was part of the problem um, in the first place, right? So, uh, and, and we can look at the effects as well. So, so far, the track record on, you know, not negotiating with terrorists has been that the costs of non-engagement tend to get passed on downward to the poor, to the needy, and to the suffering, right? The same is true, for example, with international sanctions in a lot of countries, right? So that's not the intention of those policies. The intention is to weaken governments, not cause suffering, right? So if we now are saying, well, our real concern here is to um, try to find ways to help people who are suffering and, and work to preserve human rights to the extent that we can, Right? It seems like we have to go through the gatekeepers, right? the people who are in control of the security situation, which, as Andrew said, it can be local authorities right? that can, that can sort of have, they have separate, level, that separate relationships with communities. Right? But we're going to have to go through the, the, gover the government that is in control of the territory as a whole. So, so I would say, yeah, they're right to engage. Right. And I think that I think that we are on we are on a track towards eventually getting, you know, having international recognition of the Taliban. And again, it's it's sort of a question of what are the conditions and will they work given everything else that's just been said here? Excellent. Thank you, Professor Huddleston. Ambassador, uh, if I may, in addition to Professor Wood's question, I'd like to add two from the audience. The first is from Christian Germs, who asked Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your surname, Christian. Uh, he asks, is the appointment of Mullah Mohammed Hassan Af Kund as prime minister going to affect the development of Afghanistan? Do you think he was the right choice for prime minister? And then from John Eisenhower, uh, we have a question about whether the Taliban um, has the capability and political with will to prevent uh, other terrorist groups from operating in Afghanistan. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, just I would like to, uh, before I go to the professor was question, uh, just a, a small short comment that the Taliban had really managed politically the situation of the area very well. They choose Pakistan and China and they choose Russia and Iran to make sure that once they reach to a deal with the United States, these countries would not support the, the opposition back because if the opposition was supported or if the if these countries supported the government of Afghanistan and militias, then this war would have continued quite a long time. So gain, gaining the confidence of these four countries for the Taliban and keeping them neutral was very, very important to win this war. OK, this was just a, a comment. Now, we're coming to Professor Wood's question. Uh, for me, as a person, as a diplomat, as a person who's been involved in peace, for me, one thing is very important. First thing is security. If you do not have security in a country, people will not feel safe. People will not be able to work. People will not be able to do something. Now, in the past government and in this government right now, the Taliban has shown that they are 100% capable of imposing security. I've, I've received contacts from Kabul, Herat, every place. Okay, people walk at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. They're not worried now about, about getting smug, killed, or kidnapped, or any of that. That's number one. The second issue is very important also for um, for me is that uh, the the government who are there okay does understand the complexity of the system okay if you bring people from outside and try to impose a government which is corrupt which is against the people's will which is uh, does not know the, the religious factor does not know that and they're trying to come up with their own way of democracy or any other or any other sort this will not work. So for me, 22 years ago, I was having discussions with uh, governments of the uh, Western governments and telling them that the system of fight, uh, putting Al-Qaeda beside the Taliban is not going to work. Let us fight Al-Qaeda and the terrorism separately and keep the Afghans, uh, Afghan people and the Taliban away from it. What did not happen, so they were fighting. For me, I would go if at the beginning. I will deal with them, see if they have managed to bring security, if they're if they're going to fight terrorism, ISIS and others, and are going to deal with people, you know, uh, according to the to the Afghan uh, to the Afghanistan uh, understanding of of uh, the way of life. Then, then 
I will engage with them later on and ha on the women's right, human right, uh, education, other things, because these are, this comes later on. But food, food, okay, and security comes first for me. So yeah, I will engage uh, with them, give them advice, give them like what I've done in peace. So for me, it's important that now they, they're the power now, they rehabilitate. They accept others within themselves. So this is what the international community has to work with them in order to uh, help them to accept the others while even that they've won the war. And they have managed to demilitarize very much. Now, the other question that you've mentioned is regarding Mullah Muhammad um, Akhund. Okay, I do not believe, uh, now Mullah Muhammad is a very well experienced person within among the Taliban. He was the ex deputy prime minister during the past government. So whoever comes from the high ranking uh, of the Taliban, which is the Mullah Brother, Mullah Akhund, it's, it is a Taliban government, okay, and they, it will go by the Taliban uh, idea, ideology, and there will be a, a, a straight forward, and they will uh, ask Professor, um, uh, as I said, they are not going to negotiate, they are not a negotiating team, they did not negotiate with the United States, they have a certain red line in principle that you'll go uh, by it. Um, and then, um, what was, the third question was the, uh, uh, then has the capability and political will to prevent external yes. uh, actors from operating and carrying out terrorist attacks in Afghanistan. The first thing what the Taliban did during the, 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 this year, they say that they will not allow Afghanistan to be used as, um, as a place against any other country, neighbors, including uh, other United States and other countries. Now, I do believe that the report that the United States government has given us a couple of months ago, that they were very much helpful in the fight against ISIS. So they are capable of fighting, they are capable uh, uh, politically and they're capable, but they do need, we, we ha don't have to forget that, they do need the help of the international community for intelligence information, for financial support and fighting against drug and against, against terrorism. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the issue of women's rights, which you have mentioned, uh, and we have several questions to that effect. But uh, I want to get one more question in for Professor Huddleston. And also we have a uh, question that is in Professor Wood's real house. Uh, so uh, to Professor Huddle, well, let me do Professor uh, uh, Huddleston first. Um, we have uh, the following question. From a self-determination viewpoint, do you think we will be seeing other political groups like the Polisario Group and Palestine uh, uh, liberation uh, movements mount offenses following the success of the Taliban. And the question for, if I can, well, I'll give you a chance, uh, Professor Huddleton, to start, and then I'll uh, uh, read Professor uh, Wood's question afterwards. Yeah, just just so everyone knows, our, our convocation starts in two minutes, so I'm, I'm overstaying my welcome here in order to uh, get the... Thank you. But I'm missing the Seton Hall hymn, which is so beautiful, right? So, <laughs> um, so I, I don't think we can really draw lessons from the Taliban to these self-determination groups. Um, for one, you know, the, the the nature of both of those conflicts are much more binary and local, right? So, with the Palestinian situation, it's the Israeli government, a single, very strong, very legitimate entity with you know with its own constituencies. With the Polisario, it's um, it's a decolonial de movement fight facing off directly against the Moroccan government, right? So they're both sort of, um, you might say, uh, like local. They're not. Neither are separatist movements. They're they're both sort of anti-colonial, but the, the sort of logic is different than what we see here, which is a Talib the Taliban government, which grew up around the country and resisted this sort of illegitimate government that was propped up by Western support for so long. So other places where we see governments that rely heavily on international support in order to maintain domestic sovereignty, that would be places where we can carry lessons forward, right? Uh, so, you know, watching what happens in places like Cameroon or Mali, Eritrea, where you have, you do have Western involvement sort of supporting supporting the legitimate government, that's somewhere you where you you should keep an eye and see if you see similar dynamics playing out. Um, Excellent. With that, I'll sign off. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll let you go. Thank you, Professor Huddleston. Uh, Professor Wood, uh, we have a question from Shushan Nadu, who asks, what lessons can, can the new UN envoy to Yemen take from Afghanistan 
in his interaction with Ansar Allah. And we know you are shortly about to be uh, embarking on another trip to Yemen. So what lessons uh, from the events in Afghanistan uh, over the summer uh, and the last couple of weeks in particular um, might apply to Yemen? Thanks for that. Um, similar to the response from Andrew earlier, th this is a whole, you know, we could have a whole four hours on this or even more really. I suppose there are kind of two things that are worth factoring in. So the new um, Special Envoy Hans Gottbrod, who was a former uh, EU ambassador, so he has experience already of engaging with both the internationally recognised government based from Aden, but also the Ansar Ala government based um, in Sana'a. He's constrained by his mandate. The UN Special Representatives or Special Envoys have mandates that they're there to fulfil. And so his mandate clearly states that his role is to gain agreement to the outcomes of the 2014 National Dialogue, which includes the present government and includes the um, a, a some federal arrangement. That very document, the outcome of the National Dialogue, which is what in many ways led to both the sudden movement and also um, the kind of 2015 advance by Ansar Allah. So uh, Han Gutzbrod's hands are tied by the mandate. So I don't think there's too much that can be taken across from the special envoy, other than we need to engage with all actors in all conflicts. And we need to engage with them earlier rather than later. What we've seen in terms of the uh, debacle, in terms of the, the with withdrawal and the present um, situation is that we engage too late, probably, with uh, the Taliban. Just to give you some indication of what that might mean in the Yemen context, you have a range of Houthi officials who are on uh, basically assassination lists or kill lists, which means that they're not going to engage meaningfully in a peace process. We need to get them off those lists. We need to get them talking and engaging with us. So that's the first thing. For me, the second aspect of the question, which is much more interesting in a way, is how do um, mandated missions engage with institutions or groups which are not recognized um, by the UN uh, Security Council or are not recognized by the majority of, of UN member states. What I mean by that is UNDP, for example, United Nations Development Programme or other UN institutions can only do so much. So they're not able to, for example, engage with um, the, the governments, the authorities in Sana directly. Are they going to have the room to engage with the new um, government in in Kabul. That's a big question for me. What kind of what kind of bring it back to Afghanistan? What kind of space is going to be provided for mandated agencies and missions to engage with the new authorities? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wood. I want to uh, turn now to the topic that we have been beating around the bush, which is uh, the current situation in Afghanistan uh, and the future prospects for women and girls. Um, and we've had several questions about this in the chat. Uh, I'll just read one of them here. Uh, what are the implications of the current situation in Afghanistan on women and girls? And uh, relatedly, what are the protection mechanisms for women and girls that uh, you, I believe this is directed at Andrew, suggest for international organizations. Uh, but before turning it over to the ambassador and Andrew for their thoughts on this, I do want to just add my own, which is that we've already seen from me uh, Western media reports um, that while, as the ambassador mentioned, uh, some female journalists have been allowed to continue uh, their jobs as TV reporters, we've also had disturbing stories of uh, women uh, at offices being told to go home and send their husbands back. Uh, this also uh, is uh, um, true of uh, women, female students studying at university. Um, and uh, we are in, I would say, a wait and see period to see what transpires. We've also seen a number of uh, uh, protests in Kabul, most notably by very brave women um, uh, speaking out for the protection of their rights. Uh, so uh, I would say I'm not as optimistic as uh, probably the ambassador is when it comes to the Taliban. Uh, having reformed their views. Um, I remain very concerned about the Taliban's position uh, and future uh, and current treatment of women and girls, uh, but I'll give him a chance to weigh in on the issue of uh, women's rights, uh, girls' education as well, before turning it over to Andrew for his take on what role the international community 
and international organ organizations can do to protect these vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let's be very fair. Uh, OK, the, if we go and see the what happened to women during the previous government, I'm going to give you a very simple. I don't want to make names so that we are on a public. One of the biggest officials of Afghanistan government molested 30 women, 30, 3 0 of a football team, Afghanistan football team. I don't want to mention who the football team. That person was convicted by the International Federal of, of, of Federation of Football and was supposed to go to court. And they were never allowed to go to court. He was taken by one of the toppest, toppest Afghan government people and taken right. to protect I, him. No. I don't want to condone any, any acts of abuse, no. uh, but to, distinguish professor. between individual cases and systemic. No, no, no. no, this is not a visual case. This is, this is government. See, this is a government case because this has been happening at the highest level. So what I'm trying to say that is the following that, that individual acts can happen wherever. However, the Taliban has announced at this time and they're promising, they're promising. They will allow education for women in the university and they will allow it at the school level. The only thing they're saying that we're going to put a curtain between the man and the woman. Uh, OK, that's uh, uh, now if we compare that with the last time, there's a big, a big change. Now, that's number one. They have said that they're going to allow women to work. OK, they have said that they're not at, at the ministerial positions. They have very clearly said that, but they are going to allow them to work. Now, when we engage with them, we are trying to work to change these things. We, we know what women, women's right in Islam is much more than any other right that has been given to women and many other places. This was 1,300 years ago. However, during the certain whatever kind of ideologies that are there, it is, it is, it is for me and other people, intellectuals, professors, international community to work with them to make this situation for women, for media, and for others better. Okay, I'm not saying that it's, 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 not, it's, it's even uh, close to, the, to something very good. Okay, but what I'm saying is that if we don't engage with them, this can get worse, like uh, like last time. That's what I mean. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And I'll just note my own uh, personal view again is, uh, uh, and those uh, of you watching who have uh, taken my class know that I don't put a lot of faith personally in promises. Uh, President President Reagan is famous for telling the uh, the Soviets during the Cold War when it came to arms control, trust but verify. But as I tell my colleagues and students, uh, I'm of the opinion that you verify first before you trust. Uh, but uh, I'll turn it over to you, Andrew, for your take. Yeah, thank you. Um, when it comes to what the international community can do uh, to to improve or to help assist in the protection or to persuade the Taliban to moderate its stances on on women's rights, freedoms, protections, but also those of marginalized communities, whether it's religious minorities, historically marginalized ethnic communities across Afghanistan, and, and there are many different cases. Um, there is an important nexus that isn't widely covered, but that uh, professionals in uh, public health and in education all across Afghanistan have spoken to me about over the last year. And I think it's worth highlighting here and, and, and everywhere. Uh, it's a nexus between the the changing values across Afghanistan on education and on public health and the way that this has impacted the Taliban. So give me a moment to talk through. This is less about how the international community can influence the Taliban, and it's more about how a close to universal shift in Afghan held values can be exploited and capitalized on by the international community to deal with the Taliban as they deal with new realities in their own country. So what has happened over the last 20 years is you can go and speak to the most conservative communities across the country, even to people who are related to members of the Taliban themselves. And you can ask them what they think about girls' education. Many will no longer say what they said 20, 25, 30 years ago, which is that this shouldn't exist, that this shouldn't happen. Now, some of the most conservative communities in Afghanistan say, well, girls should be educated, but only in the Holy Quran, only in religious studies, only to become a better Muslim, 
to serve their family or perhaps with some restrictions such as only in classrooms with other girls, only taught by women teachers. But you know what? That is an unspoken acknowledgement that girls do have the right to an education of some form. Now we're debating the how, not the what. Now we're debating differences and variations, not the, 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 the essence of whether or not that education should take place at all. And though that's a very small step, there is room for the international community to engage because even in the most conservative parts of the country, the Taliban are now having to respond to that in local communities where they draw their support. There's an intersection of this change in values around the country with how public health is perceived. Again, in the most remote and conservative parts of the country, public health is now understood, and we mean basic services, most people in Afghanistan still don't have access to surgery or even to uh, uh, pharmaceuticals um, that, that, that you would expect to, to treat a variety of illness. But basic health services, uh, especially midwifing, is now regarded as something that should be provided by either the government or the, the authorities, which have been the Taliban in much of the rural countryside, uh, for a long time now. And so these rural communities look to the Taliban and they say, if you are the authority and if you are in charge, we want some public health. But the most conservative societies to treat women expect there to be women healthcare professionals. And then the international community is able to confront the Taliban with a pretty pressing question. Where do you think that Afghan female health professionals are going to come from? if not from women's education, girls' education. So there are, I'm talking about baby steps in terms of the evolution of, of thought when it comes to social norms and restrictions, but there, there is room to give here and there's room for international organizations to debate and discuss and negotiate. As I would note, UNICEF and some UN agencies have already done with some success with the Taliban in the last year or two. Uh, hopefully that can continue. Thank you, Andrew. And I would just note also that uh, within the past 10 days or so, I saw media reports that the Taliban uh, in Kabul was actually specifically requesting uh, female medical practitioners uh, to remain at their jobs uh, to, for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, recognizing that they perform a vital role. However, um, at the same time, while you acknowledge that the Taliban um, has appeared uh, to move the needle, so to speak, from its no education of uh, girls to recognizing, well, maybe some, but religious education of girls, uh, and, and that, that, that constitutes pro progress, albeit baby steps, as you noted, it, you know, the counter argument, the devil's argument uh, uh, would say, well, uh, um, there is no disputing that, the, the, especially for women in Kabul, um, uh, the, pa who, the past 20 years promised a much better, brighter future. And what they're experiencing right now is a backsliding Right. Uh, 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 and, and that's what's so disturbing to uh, so many uh, Afghan women that I've um, seen interviewed and, and, and uh, to uh, uh, outsiders as well. I do want to go to a question that will um, uh, apply to all of us. And that's from Kyle Jensen, who asks, uh, what circumstances led to such a quick collapse of the Afghan government structures, and we might add uh, the army as well, the security forces, that were supported by the United States? In other words, what failed? And um, while I give my fellow panelists a chance to collect their thoughts, because there's a lot to say, let me just weigh in with my own quick two cents here. Um, obviously, this is something that the US government and others will be studying for decades to come because uh, while many people, myself included, did uh, anticipate that the uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, government would collapse, um, my own personal uh, estimate was that it would um, take six to 12 months. I thought it wouldn't happen before the spring. So the speed is what caught me by surprise, not the outcome. Uh, and uh, from the analysis that I've read, I think probably the best take as to why 
uh, is a piece that Sarah Chase wrote. Uh, she is a longtime Afghan expert, has consulted uh, uh, various uh, U.S. administrations and military uh, commanders as well over the years. And she identified three reasons. Uh, Afghan corruption enabled by U.S. corruption, right, contractors uh, and such as the first. Uh, second, Pakistan, which we haven't really talked about. Uh, and uh, third, uh, Hamid Karzat. Um, so uh, I'm happy uh, to, I'll, uh, while the others talk, I'll paste a link to that analytical piece she posted about two weeks ago. Um, but that view uh, nicely encapsulates my own also view as to uh, some, probably the three most important of the many reasons why uh, the Afghan state and security forces crumpled as quickly as they did. But why don't we go uh, in the following order? Uh, we'll go uh, Professor Wood, the ambassador, and then Andrew. Uh, why? did the Afghan state and security forces collapse as quickly as they did? I really have no knowledge on this, so I will hand on straight away. But thank you for, the, for giving me the opportunity. Ambassador, what's your take? Uh, sure. Uh, I personally believe that uh, I do agree with this report that uh, you said uh, that first of all, and the most important was uh, corruption within the government itself, financially, and corruption within the military itself and the security apparatus. For example, the number of security officers was written 300,000 uh, registered, but uh, I'm sure that you know that all the reports say it couldn't have reached the 300,000. It's at least maybe almost a half of that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, militias, uh, making militias within the government uh, organizations. That's another thing, okay? That would reduce the power of the military, okay? For example, Arbaki and the two through others departments through the Ministry of Interior, which Mr. Atmar did when he was the Minister of Interior. And then during this government, they also created a new militia. So that would also, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, hurt the, the military organization. And the other thing is security itself. I mean, the, the, the military or the police could not provide security security while while at the areas under the control of the Taliban see there was a comparison okay there was security at the suburbs more uh, more much more than it was in the in the urban uh, urban so so that that mat uh, the matter of uh, of having that created and as you said also interference from outside also I, I, we do say that but for those who say that Pakistan interfered don't forget that in the other side 40 NATO countries was with the government so it's a one against 40 doesn't you know uh, create a very big balance also Andrew? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, not to completely disagree, but I do want to complicate the recommendation of the Sarah Chea's piece. I actually would not recommend that piece, uh, certainly not to, to casual readers or people who are not deeply steeped in narratives and discourse about Afghanistan for a few reasons. One, because everything that Sarah Chea has to say about Pakistan is very well informed, but it's embedded within two decades worth of back and forth about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan. And, and if one thing is true about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan, it's that no one has an objective opinion about it. And that it, it, and the number of people you ask about Pakistan's role is the number of different opinions and, and uh, perspectives you will receive about it. Um, and so that's something that's always, we in discussions about Afghanistan, we do often elide Pakistan's role, but I think that's also because it's ground that has been tread and retread, um, and it's also impossible to agree, agree on. The other thing is what Shayas has to say about Hamid Karzai is likewise informed in a way that I think few international observers or Westerners has been. Uh, she spent time in, in Kandahar, in, in the cultural hub and capital of the country's southern half, uh, longer than almost anybody I know or have worked with in Afghanistan. Um, but, but there is a bit of parsing through the trees at, 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 the, at the risk of forsaking the forest in the way that she identifies Hamid Karzai as, as a one of three primary reasons why the entire country's political apparatus and, and military forces fell apart, 
Hamid Karzai has limited to no influence in the entire northern half of the country, which is where the military fell apart and where the Taliban made its advances first before any of the major cities or before the rest of the South fell. And, and, and so I think it's reflective of her deep, deep experiences, but it's quite, anyway, it's quite embedded in, in a lot of other discussion on Afghanistan. Because I mentioned the North, I do want to, I, just very quickly and being conscious of time, the ambassador is correct. There was so much corruption taking place in, in the security forces. I would actually say if people are curious about the collapse of the Afghan state, one of the most surprising things is that it's not a surprise at all. And, and, and Professor, to your point as well, I also was not predicting the speed with which the state collapsed, but as soon as it did, it made perfect sense. The war in Afghanistan, or the United States' war in Afghanistan, has something that very few American military interventions have had, which is a dedicated special inspector general, the, the SIGAR for Afghanistan reconstruction. And I would recommend any of their reports their lessons learned documentation, or even the Washington Post and, and its uh, summary of a lot of SIGAR's findings over the years, which they're calling the Afghanistan Papers. All of the evidence and all of the reasons for the weaknesses of the Afghan state are embedded right there. There's something to the speed of the collapse I think when we talk about the root causes for why the military fell apart and why the state at its highest levels of leadership collapsed, we have to look at what was happening inside the Afghan state and foreign failures to, to help build up that state in a way that was effective at all. But there is also, I think, a difference between the root causes and the catalyst. And it would be unfair of us to not look at the way that the United States approached dealing with the Taliban and the way that it marginalized and in some ways delegitimized the Afghan government and the way that that played out in international media, which trickled down into Afghan national media, which trickled down into social media. And I can tell you that I've spoken to people, uh, Afghan soldiers and policemen who fled posts as the Taliban was gaining momentum this spring and summer, who fled posts because they were told through WhatsApp chats, through group messages on Telegram, and messages conveyed through their local elders, through their uncles, through their grandfathers who were being told tens of thousands of Taliban are at the gates. Even though you are only the guard of a checkpoint, in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan, you need to now believe that 10,000 Taliban are coming just for you. And of course, the reality was sometimes there were no Taliban coming for them at all. Or if they were, it was several dozen in a few pickup trucks. No, but the fact- Psychological ops operation as well, right? We, we shouldn't think of it as a military campaign. Uh, as the ambassador noted, right, only three provinces witnessed fighting. And uh, apologies, but I just want to interject. You've, you've made very valid, excellent interventions, Andrew, and I thank you. And as I suspect, uh, uh, we have enough uh, uh, material to continue, as will the U.S. government and others, uh, debating why Afghanistan uh, collapsed as quickly as it did. I also want to um, just quickly echo your reference to the cigar and the Greg Whitlock book, the Afghan um, papers. He's been doing a lot of media hits right now, and, and do a, a plug for my own research um, uh, where I've been interviewing uh, U.S. and NATO uh, military and political officials responsible uh, for training Afghan national security forces going back to 2004 um, at, at places like C. Sticka, which was the U.S. Uh, uh, military command. Um, and, uh, you know, the reports of, of inflated uh, numbers, uh, logistics problems, corruption in the military, um, desertion, right? Uh, we've known about all of this. Uh, and, and again, um, uh, there are a lot of reasons why Afghanistan, um, uh, events in Afghanistan this summer unfolded um, uh, the way uh, it did. Uh, we'll have to save some of those for perhaps a future panel, but I want to just give everyone in the remaining six minutes, uh, two minutes uh, to wrap up. 
Uh, any final thoughts, uh, what we should look out for? I mean, one of the questions we had um, that perhaps is a good food for thought is what specific indicators should we be looking for as we try to assess the political maturity of the new Afghan government, right? Uh, are there certain um, metrics or commitments, um, uh, obviously upholding commitments to human rights, inclusiveness, women's rights? What else should be we looking for to see uh, as we try to evaluate the uh, 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 credibility and, uh, and, and, and of this new government. So, uh, Ambassador, uh, first to you, and then Andrew, and then Professor Wood. I don't know if you want to uh, weigh in, and then uh, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I believe that the first priority for anything will be the fight against terrorism. Uh, that the Taliban should be ready to fight terrorism and not allow Afghanistan to be used as a base for terrorism against terrorism, uh, base for terrorism. That's number one. Number two, demilitarizing all the militias and gathering illegal weapons. That is the most important thing the Taliban should be concentrating on so that we do not have such problems again in future. And uh, the other thing, number number three, which is very, very uh, important from uh, from my point of view, is that uh, the Taliban should have inclusive idea, having inclusivity of the Afghan people, not the Afghan politicians. The international community should not push the, Af uh, the Taliban to bring back those corrupt politicians and the corrupt government, government uh, people in the past, whoever they are and whoever name they are, because that's what we are looking at. The media and the other, gov the other governments are pushing, uh, saying that uh, Mr. So and Mr. So and Mr. So should be uh, you know, uh, involved. So we cannot, see, we cannot have corruption together with security, together with, with fight against corruption. So if we want the Taliban to fight against corruption, bring security, bring fight the ter uh, terrorism, fight drugs, then you have to keep corruption away. Uh, and the only way to do that is to have true Afghans, Afghans who are from different uh, tribes, Afghans from, from different, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the religious, religious factors, and technocrats and uh, experts from outside and inside women uh, to be involved. That is what we should be looking for and not pushing them to bring back those other uh, corrupt people. Thank you. Professor Wood? Again, I'm not the expert here, so I'd like to hear what you and Andrew have to say. But thank you for giving me the opportunity. All right. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think indicators that we need to look for are, are not only how the Taliban engage on the looming economic crisis that they're going to face and the number of humanitarian crises that they face and the way that they grapple with those, whether they want to engage with Western nations or not, whether they accept any sort of uh, moderation or, or conditionality, the, how seriously they take the dire state of the Afghan economy and the plight of millions of Afghans themselves is going to be the ultimate measure of what they are as a government. On the same, on the flip side of that coin is, can Western governments that up until weeks ago saw the Taliban as an adversary and an enemy do the right thing for close to 40 million Afghan people and find a creative way to get life-saving and emergency assistance to those people, regardless of the complications and the difficulties of dealing with the Taliban and whether or not the Taliban benefit from assistance and funding, that's what really matters right now. Excellent, thank you. Um, my own take is that certainly for the vantage, from the vantage point and position of Washington, the US government, um, the primary indicator and metric that they will be using to assess their future relationship with uh, this government will be uh, the whether uh, the uh, early cooperation we've seen between uh, U the U.S. military uh, and uh, the Taliban in a, uh, both while the uh, Kabul airport was open, Hamad Karzai International Airport, um, and as well after uh, August 31st, initially after the August 31st deadline, um, there were some uh, uh, reports that uh, the Taliban were not allowing American citizens um, to uh, try to reach the airport. But in the last couple of days, we have seen some um, diplomatic flights and commercial flights leave with American citizens, uh, and it's hard to imagine 
imagine that happening without tacit support of the Taliban on the ground. So I think from the U.S. vantage point, uh, whether that continues in the coming weeks and months uh, and whether that uh, is extended not just to U.S. citizens and green card holders, but also uh, Afghans who have CIVs, special uh, immigrant uh, visas, as well as others who may wish to leave, uh, is what the U.S. will be looking for as the number one indicator. Um, but in terms of the wider international community, as well as what I will be looking at myself, uh, I would agree with the ambassador that uh, uh, domestic support right, and particularly from the technocrats as well as from women, uh, whether uh, um, they are both welcomed and choose to participate uh, in the uh, societal roles that uh, they have grown accustomed to in these uh, past 20 years. Uh, so that's what I'll be looking for in terms of indicators to assess um, uh, the future credibility uh, of the Taliban government. Uh, with that, uh, it is exactly 5 p.m., uh, so I want to thank our panelists and our uh, audience for uh, a wonderful discussion. And I uh, very much hope that we'll be able to continue this Ask the expert series as uh, events unfold uh, throughout the uh, rest of the year. So my thanks to all of you and uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really enjoyed thank it. You. Thank you.